Okay. Open your Bibles to Ephesians and stay there. We're going to be looking at the next piece in the Armor of God, this series that we've been engaged in. And I hope that you are encouraged. Thank you, Amber, for the, for the feedback. Um, today we're looking at the helmet of salvation. And would you agree with me that helmets are important? Yeah, I think they are. There's been a long debate in, in, uh, in America about whether or not they're so important we should actually make them legal. Um, I guess I've got to turn this on. I'm really tech challenged today, aren't I? Helmets are important whether you are an athlete, whether you are a policeman, whether you're just a construction worker, or you're a biker or a cyclist. All of those helmets represent life-saving um, protection. All those people survived. Had they not had that helmet on, the green helmet is actually from the Pulse nightclub. A uh, policeman was wearing that, and he would have been done had he not had that helmet on. That motorcycle sends chills up my spine. Kyle, take a look at that, buddy. Glad you got a helmet, man. Um, and the soldier, see that soldier in the upper right corner? He's real. I don't know how he survived that. It looks to me like the bullet went through. There's a hole in the helmet, but I guess it slowed down the velocity of the bullet and protected him. And he just got a head bandage and a historic photo to, to show. But helmets are important. They protect something very vital, obviously, something very critical. They protect your brain. And uh, if you lose your brain, you're done. You're gone, right? Well, in this series, when we talk about our fight against an invisible enemy, we can't see Satan. We don't see the devil. But we certainly see his influence, don't we? We see the impact that he has throughout history, throughout our culture, our society. Um, and we see a lot of the suffering that maybe Satan is sometimes behind. We can't always know when the devil is responsible for something that we fall into, a trial, a temptation. Uh, we don't always know that. God doesn't give us, you know, that, that power. He doesn't me, at least. I don't always know if it's Satan, my own fallen heart, the world, the flesh. Um, but we definitely see the effects of our enemy. He is very cunning. He is very powerful. He is very strategic. And that's why we need armor. And specifically, this may be one of the most important pieces of armor uh, because of what it represents, because of what it protects. And you remember, we've been looking at each piece of this armor, and we've said from the beginning that all of this armor belongs to God, and it's given to us freely. We didn't earn it. We didn't buy it. We didn't merit this armor. It belongs to God. That's why the very first verse, verse in this passage says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Take up the armor of God. It doesn't say be strong in your own might. It doesn't say trust in your ingenuity, trust in your wisdom, trust in your integrity, trust in your faithfulness, trust in your righteousness. It doesn't say any of that. It says this is God's armor, and all of this armor represents the freedom, the benefits, um, the privileges of the gospel. What did Jesus purchase for us on the cross? What do we get? What's our inheritance? All of this armor are metaphorical pictures of what we have in Christ and why we're supposed to continually use it. You don't just get it when you walk in the kingdom. It's how you live in God's kingdom. So that's what this represents. And if you go out in the battle to fight against the enemy and you're not protected, then you're going to be easy pickings for him. And I see that. As a pastor, I see it. As a Christian, I see it. That a lot of people don't have this armor on. And look, this is just one little passage in the Bible all of these benefits are represented all over the New Testament because it's so important. I just like the real succinct, succinct military method that Paul uses to just lay out and explain what this armor is here. So we're going to look at it. Because of this way this, this sentence is actually structured in Greek, um, it could actually be read, the helmet. Put on the helmet, which is salvation. So it's the helmet of salvation. This helmet represents salvation. So we're going to talk about what exactly does it mean. That's a broad... I mean, I say salvation, that can mean a hundred things to different people. Even in the church, even Christians, thinking about different aspects of their salvation. So I want to try to nail down what I believe that the Apostle Paul is talking about. Because listen, he talks about this helmet in another place in the Bible. One of his other letters. This is a letter to the church at Ephesus, to the Ephesians. He wrote another letter to the Thessalonians who had planted a church in the city of uh, Thessalonica. And this is what he said, 1 Thessalonians 5, 8. He said, since we belong to the day, let us be sober. And he doesn't just mean uh, don't have an alcohol-induced intoxication there. He means be thoughtful, be mindful. Let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. So we know this. We know Paul has in mind at least... One aspect of this helmet is the hope 
of salvation. You know, when we talk about salvation, if you've been in the church very long, maybe you've, you've engaged in conversation and people talk about being saved only in the past tense. Well, I was saved. I gave my life to Christ. I made a decision for Jesus. However it is, we tend to think about salvation in the past tense, which is the moment we turned from our sins, we saw the, the beauty, the power, the love of Christ, the Holy Spirit drew us, opened our eyes to see our serious situation that we're sinners and we sit under judgment. We're going to face the curse of God if we don't trust Christ and His finished work. And so we believe. And then the Bible says, in that moment, you're justified. You are declared blameless. The guilt is gone. There's no more condemnation. So in that sense, you were saved. You were pardoned. The penalty of your sin was removed. That's justification. But you know, salvation encompasses all eternity, right? So not only were you saved, past tense, did you know the Bible says you're being saved right now as a Christian, you are continually being saved. You're being changed. You're being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. God is changing you and shaping your heart, um, changing your affections and your desires. And the Bible calls that sanctification. I know these are fancy theological words, but I want to teach them to you because they're in the Bible. Justification is the penalty of your sin is taken away. Sanctification is the power of your sin is being taken away. Gradually, that's progressive. Um, but that's not all there is. I sound like a salesman. But there's more. No, wait. There's the future salvation, the hope of glory that the Bible talks about. And that is, and beloved, this is a grand thought. That day when the presence of your sin will be taken away. That's called what? Glorification. We're not glorified yet. We still sin. As Christians even, we sin. We fail. We get tempted. We grow weak. We get angry. I mean, all kinds of things. We fall victim to the temptations of Satan, the flesh, the world. So when we talk about salvation, there's past, there's present, and there's future. And I think Paul has all of this in mind. All of this is the hope of glory that God is continually... Um, he is continually at work securing and, and, and finalizing the work he began the moment that we were justified by faith. So, how does Satan attack? If we're talking about this battle that we're in, and we're talking about putting a helmet on, and that helmet represents salvation, how exactly does this play out in, in warfare? Well, I believe this. I believe that Satan attacks us in the area of salvation by aiming at our security and our assurance, and our hope. Those are three things he aims at. Our assurance, our, our security, and our hope. Meaning, salvation for us represents that this is, everything we see is not reality, right? There is a future reality that awaits us, the hope of glory. We're going to be glorified one day. We're going to inhabit a renewed planet we're going to have glorified bodies. We're not going to suffer anymore. We're never going to hear the word war or sin again. And we're going to sit and dine at the table of the king. Amen? That's a grand thought. We're going to reign with him forever, the Bible says. And I think Satan attacks us at that very point. He doesn't want you to think about that. But we should. There, there's a power in that, that that is unleashed in your life. When you look around and you think, this is it. This is, this is everything that I see. So we're going to get into that a little bit this morning. The sermon outline this morning is just a couple of points. How does Satan attack our, our salvation, our assurance? Um, one, doubt. He gives us doubt. You're not really saved. Boy, that is a big one. That's the big first point there. And the second one is, you're not making any difference. Look around. Nothing's changing. You're doing all this in vain. Why don't you just give up? This is too hard. You're weary. You're scared. The battle's intense. Just give up. Go back to your old way of living. It's not a big deal. He attacks Christians on those two very points right there. So I want to talk about both of those. Point number one, doubt. Satan says you're not really a Christian. How could you possibly believe that God has lavished his love and affection on a person like you? I mean, look at the thoughts you have. Look at the way you treat other people. Look how little you read your Bible. Look how little you worship. Yeah, you worship on Sunday, but what about the rest of the week? I mean, Satan, that's where his arsenal is aimed. And if you don't have your helmet of salvation on and think, this is Christians are supposed to think. We're supposed to reason. We're supposed to meditate on the truths that we find in the Bible about who we are in Christ. And if you don't have that helmet on, you're going to be pickings for Satan. You're going to make his job really easy. That's why the Bible tells us in so many ways to gird up the loins of our mind and to think soberly and rightly. So this is an attack on our assurance. A few weeks ago, I actually mentioned 
um, the term eternal security. And man, I got a lot of feedback. And some of it was encouraging. People were like, man, that's great. I've never heard that before. That's wonderful. I always knew, I think, I believe, you can't lose your salvation, but I didn't really know why. Some of the other feedback I got was a little bit enlightening. It didn't concern me because everybody thinks this way sometimes. They said, now, pastor, we've got to be careful. We've got to be careful talking about this eternal security thing because, you know, if you, if you give Christians security, they're going to be presumptuous and they're going to start living reckless lives and, and jeopardize everything and, and, and live loosely and take risk. And, you know, like Bill Murray and, and Groundhog Day, he knew no matter what he did, he's waking up the next morning in bed safe and sound, right? So what did he do? Well, he committed gluttony. Uh, he drove his truck off a cliff with a groundhog up front with him. He electrocuted himself. He was mean to women. I mean, people think that Christians will act that way if you somehow tell them, hey, look, Jesus paid it all and you are secure. He's granted you eternal life. He's pledged himself eternally to you in a covenant. And the Bible says you belong to him. He belongs to you. You're in his hand and nobody can snatch you out of his hand because the father who keeps you is greater than all. And they're like, oh, yeah, I know that's in there, but man, we got to be careful. Let's just, let's just kind of not really talk about that. Let's tell people, be on the guard, give them all these warnings, which the Bible does. The warnings in the Bible are a means of grace to continue to persevere. But people tend to have a really hard time with that. And I say, now, now hang on a minute. Remember, we're in a battle here. This is serious. This is warfare. Our enemy hates us. All his arsenal and weaponry are aimed at us. What do you think the one thing is that he wants to steal from you, um, it's your joy, right? You know, one of, the, one of the things that leads to joy is assurance. The whole epistle that the Apostle John wrote, 1 John, five chapters, he said, these things have been written so that your what may be full? Joy. It's not fear. <laughs> Perfect love from God cast out all fear. God doesn't want us to be, brothers and sisters, on the edge of our seat, always wondering where we stand with him. Does God love me today? Have I done enough? Is he angry at me? Is God going to take away my salvation? Listen, I'm a son. I see many daughters and sons out there. Let me ask you a question. What kind of a relationship could you have with your father or your mother if you thought at any given moment they may withdraw your status as their son or daughter? What kind of a paranoid, schizophrenic life are you going to live? I'm serious. Because listen, a lot of children live their life that way. God doesn't want us to live our life that way. He wants us to know, you are my children. That's why the Bible says the Holy Spirit actually bears witness with your spirit that you are children of God. And we cry out, Abba, Father. It means Daddy in Greek. It's a term of endearment. God wants you to know that you're His. And no matter what happens, because we're adopted, we're adopted. And you know, when you adopt somebody in ancient uh, Roman culture, no matter what you did, you could never rescind that adoption. It was a done deal, sealed by documents from a wax seal from Caesar himself. And it's the same way. The Bible says we're adopted. We're united to Christ. Nothing could ever threaten our identity as children of God. So let me ask you a question. If it's that important, if assurance is that important, and it is, and you were the devil, <laughs> don't take that too far. Some of you may feel like a devil sometimes. And, and you are an amazing thief. In fact, you're the best thief in the whole planet. Because the devil is. He's come to steal, rob, and destroy, right? And you want to take something precious from the children of God that you hate. They bear the image of your enemy. So you hate them, right? They've experienced salvation. You, you're going to be damned eternally in hell forever. So you're angry to boot. And you could take something that's the most precious and valuable to them. What is it that you would take? What would you aim at? You guys ever seen Despicable Me? I have kids, so I have an excuse. You know the villain in that that you kind of come to love and appreciate? His name's, is it Gru? It's Gru, right? He's always looking for the most valuable thing to steal. He and his little minions, right? Um, what is it? If you, if, if you were like a satanic, if you were a satanic Gru, what would you be after? I can tell you right now, you would be after people's assurance. You would want to take that. You would draw your crosshairs around that and you would want to rob it because you would know exactly what it would do if you took it. And I see the effects of that with a lot of Christians. Listen, God, God doesn't want us, I'll be careful talking about assurance. No, 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 no. God wants us to have assurance because assurance has an amazing result and, and, and impact on the way you live your Christian life. Listen to this. Horatius Bonar said this. This is actually up here. I want you to read this. This is really good, guys. 
He said, uncertainty as to our relationship with God is one of the most enfeebling and dispiriting of things. It makes a man or woman heartless. It takes the pith out of them. They cannot fight. They cannot run. They are easily dismayed and they give way. They can do nothing for God. Now just stop right there. Did you just hear? This guy was an amazing theologian and pastor and writer, by the way. If, if being robbed and deprived of your assurance has that kind of effect, do you think God wants you to be deprived of it? No. Do you think Satan wants you to be? Absolutely. With all of his might. He can't steal your salvation. He can steal your assurance of salvation if you let him. And that's what he's after. But listen to the rest of this quote. But when we know that we are of God, we are vigorous, we are brave, we are invincible. That's what the helmet of salvation is. There is no more quickening truth than this of assurance. Yeah, this is the most important thing. And listen, you know what's sad to me as a Christian? I want, I want to be real with you and honest with you. This is what's so sad to me as a Christian, as a church planner, and as a pastor. I see people that when Satan is engaging them at this, at this point of conflict in their mind, they just roll over and give in. It's like there's not even a fight. I don't know if it's because they don't have any ammunition. It's like they, they are so easily convinced that God doesn't love them anymore that he doesn't love them, that he's done with them, that they're unredeemable, that they messed up, that they failed, that they're too weak, they're not earnest enough. I see that all the time and it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart. That's why I preach on this so much. This is is something that God wants to unleash in your heart. And one of you say, are you going to, today Mother's Day, are you going to preach anything? Look, I'll be real with you again. I've counseled hundreds of people in my time as a Christian. One of these days, hopefully, I'll be able to see thousands. But for now, it's hundreds. But that's a lot of people that have been sitting in front of me. And I want to tell you, I'm just giving you the raw statistics. The number one candidate I've seen in my ministry that struggles with assurance is are moms. Moms. I don't know why. I'm going to ask the next one that I talk to, like, what are, you know, uh, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's all these mommy blogs out there. They just feel so, they don't stack up. They don't compare. I'm not a good Christian mom. I'm not a good uh, Christian wife. I don't know what it is, but I thought, you know what? Um, Everyone will be encouraged by this today, and maybe moms especially will be encouraged by this. So that's why I chose to talk on this today. Charles Spurgeon said this once. He preached on assurance all the time in his ministry. He's one of my favorite preachers. And he always used logic to combat faulty thinking. He said, okay, so we're saying that you can lose your salvation. A lot of people believe that. Okay, Spurgeon said this. If one dear saint of God had perished, so might all. If one of the covenant ones be lost, so may all be. And then there is no gospel promise that's true, but the Bible is a lie and there is nothing in it worth my acceptance. Man, he puts it out there, doesn't he? He says, I I will be lost at once when I can believe that a saint of God can ever fall away finally. If God hath loved me once, then he will love me forever. And I say, amen. And let me tell you what Spurgeon is saying. He's saying, if I could lose my salvation, I would. And I would echo that. If I could lose my salvation, I would have already lost it. And I would lose it every single day. And let me be really real with you, so would you. Because we all fail and we all sin. All the time we do. Even as Christians we do. It's hard to admit that at times. But the Bible says if we lie and say we had no sin, then we, we lie and the truth is not in us. And, I, and I'm always wanting to, when I talk to people, it's like, okay, if we can lose our salvation, uh, what is it? What qualifies for that? Is, is it, I embellished, I'm telling a, a story about my son catching a fish and it was an eight pound bass and I know that and I say it was a 10 pound bass. Am I, did I lose my salvation? Because I just lied. I just broke a commandment. And look, I'm not saying lies are, I'm not saying there's white lies and all that. A lie is a lie, and one lie is enough to damn you to hell forever, right? Um, so did I, did I lose my salvation? What, what if I gossip? Um, I mean, what, I, I would lose my salvation all day long. I mean, what, what kind of a paranoid mode of existence would that be? No, the Bible says when you sin, you confess your sin. You repent. You ask God to forgive you. You ask the Holy Spirit to strengthen you, give you resolve and power to say no to ungodliness when you're tempted the next time. But beloved, if my son sins against me, I'll say, okay, you're not my son anymore. You know, we'll see how you do this week. I don't know. You know, try a little bit harder. Maybe you'll be Jackson Clayton again by Friday if you really hold out there. That's how some Christians live their life. And I'm not mocking them or ridiculing that. I'm just saying that argument doesn't hold water when you come to the Bible. And it doesn't hold water when you look at the eternal covenant nature of our salvation that God has given us through His Son. It just doesn't add up. 
When I, when I think of this, people robbing assurance and the jury's still out on whether you're saved or not, I think of a, of a movie that, that I like. I like war movies. I like war books. And one of my favorite movies is Saving Private Ryan. Maybe you've seen it. There's a really powerful scene at the very end of that movie. Now, the movie is about a band of eight people under the leadership of Captain John Miller, who is um, Tom Hanks. And after D-Day... This grieving mother in the Midwest, in America, learns that three of her sons were killed on the same day in the invasion of Normandy. Can you imagine, as a mom, three, it's based on true story, by the way. Three of your sons died, you've got one more son, and he's fighting over in Germany. And so the military in America came together and they said, we got to go get him. we got to go get him and take him home to his mom. We, she can't spare her fourth son. So eight men are assigned the task of going through war-torn Germany in fighting territory behind enemy lines and finding Private James Ryan and bringing him home. And all the men in this, in this company are already bitter. They're like, seriously, eight people? We're risking the lives of eight soldiers to save one no-name private. What in the world? But they find him. At the very end of the movie, they find him. Tom Hanks finds him. And they have one more battle before they send him back. And in this battle, Tom Hanks is shot. He's mortally wounded. He's bleeding out. He's dying. It's a powerful scene. And James Ryan realizes, man, this guy gave his life to save me, to find me. And they're sitting there, and Tom Hanks, Captain Miller, says, James, come here. He's dying. He's his last breath. He's dying. He says, come here. And he, whisp and he whispers something in his ear. And you can barely hear it when you're, reading, when you're watching the movie. I had to Google. You ever do that? You ever watch a movie? And then you're like, Google that. See what really happened. So I Google it, and this is what he says. He, he, he draws him really close and he says, James, earn this. Earn it. And then he dies. It's powerful. It's really powerful. And the very next scene in the movie, fast forwards, James Ryan's life. You can see the picture there. He's a ripe old age grandpa with kids all over the place. He's walking in probably Arlington Cemetery or somewhere. And he walks up to Captain John Miller's tombstone. And he has this conversation with... Uh, Captain Miller, and this is what he says. Every day, I think about what you said to me that day on the bridge. And I've tried to live my life the best I could. I hope that was enough. I hope that at least in your eyes, I've earned what all of you have done for me. And then his wife walks up. And she has a sad look, he has a sad look on his face. And he turns to her and he says, tell me. Tell me I've lived a good life. And she's bewildered. She says, what? What are you talking about, honey? And he says, tell me I'm a good man. And then the movie's over. She says like, yeah, yeah, you are. And then the movie's over. That's it. Now, I want, I want to be honest with you. That's a powerful scene. And that's also a very good depiction of the way a lot of people live their Christian life. Because listen, they think that the last words Jesus said when he was hanging on the cross, bleeding out, was earn this. That, but that's not how I remember that. Is that how you remember the last words of Jesus? Is that what he said? Tommy, Tommy, earn this. <laughs> you know, that's, that's every other religion in the world, earn this. I read somewhere where Buddha uh, said, the last words that Buddha said were strive. Strive. You know, the last words that Jesus said, it wasn't strive, it wasn't earn this, it wasn't good luck, kiddo, I hope you make it in the end. You know what it was? It's finished. One word in Greek, to die. It's finished, and it was finished, and it still is finished. Jesus paid it all. That's the assurance we have. The Bible says we've been given eternal life. I mean, I, I want to be a, 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 what do you call it, a lectarian, <laughs> grammarian. Um, the word eternal actually means something, right? I mean, if God gives you eternal life, by the very definition of the word, you don't lose it. It's not temporary, uh, so anyway, I'm kind of going off script here. That movie was powerful, and it just reminds me. Maybe some people, even in this room, you're living your life by the, hey, earn this. Guys, stop it. <laughs> you take, that's not a helmet. That's a baseball hat <laughs> that you have on there. The earn it thing, take it off and put on the armor of God. Put on the helmet of the hope of salvation and live your life in the freedom that God intended for you to. And listen, you're not going to live presumptuously and loosely. You know what that's going to do? It's going to do what that quote earlier said. It's going to make you resilient. It's going to make you grateful that the battle has been won. The war is over. You have victory, right? It's amazing. 
John chapter 10, verse 27 through 29, Jesus said this. He said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. Man, that's, I mean, take that to the bank. If you're a child of God, you've been given eternal life. You belong to Jesus, you'll never perish. And then he goes further, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I mean, isn't that amazing? Aren't you glad that those words of Jesus were recorded for us? Listen, we work hard as Christians. We do, but not so that we can win. It's, it's that we've already been given the victory. We don't work up and labor for our assurance. We labor from our assurance, right? There's a big difference there. It's our identity as, as Christians. It's, it's not achieved, it's received. That's all the difference. That makes all the difference in the world. All the difference. And I want to go a little bit deeper here, okay? So put your thinking hats on this morning. This church, in our statement of faith, you can read that we are a Reformed church, which believes that we believe in the same biblical doctrines that the Reformers believed in, um, that some of my favorite theologians believe in, the, the doctrines that launched the Great Awakening in America in the 1740s, and that is this. Our assurance and our security are rooted in the reality that before the foundation of the world, God chose us, the Bible says. He drew a circle around you, child of God. He set his affections on you. He, your name was written, the Bible says, in the Lamb's book of life before you were ever born, before the planets were created and the stars were flung out into outer space. You were written in the Lamb's book of life. The Bible says the Father chose you. And then it says he sent the Son to redeem you. All the members of the Trinity were involved in your salvation. This is the helmet we put on, okay? The Father chose you. The Son came, lived the perfect life that God demands from all of us that none of us were able to do. He lived the perfect life and then He bore the wrath of God in our place. He was our substitute. So He redeemed us. And then listen to this. The Father chose you. The Son redeemed you and died for you. And the Bible says the Spirit drew you the Holy Spirit of God was sent to open your eyes, to regenerate your heart, to quicken your spirit, and to apply the finished work of redemption to your heart. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all of them were involved even before the foundations of the world in choosing you, electing you, drawing you, were predestined to be children of God and to be conformed to the image of Christ, the Bible says. I know this is deep stuff, but listen, guys, if those truths are real, and they are, they're in the Bible. All that does is just beef up my eternal security. I didn't initiate my salvation. Jesus said to the disciples, you didn't choose me, I chose you. Man, that's encouraging to me. And, and people even take that doctrine and say, oh man, so then unless God, unless I guess I'm not elect, no, the Bible says there's no such thing as a sinner who's willing to be saved and a savior who's unwilling to receive them. And you know what? There's, sometimes there's tension in the Bible. God is sovereign and man is responsible. Somebody asked Charles Spurgeon, how do you reconcile those two things? And Spurgeon said, I don't reconcile friends. <laughs> I don't feel like I need to. God's sovereign. I celebrate that. And man's responsible. I celebrate that. And God gets all the glory for our salvation. So I think the work of of electing sovereign grace is the bedrock of our assurance. So listen, when he says put the helmet on, it's a good thing to meditate on that doctrine. Amen? Dig it up. Look up those passages. Just ruminate on, wow, God's electing love goes from the foundation. Before I was ever created, he set his love and affection on me. So how in the world would he willingly turn me loose if I sinned and fell him? You know, his glory's on the line. He saved you for his namesake. Man, I feel like I'm monologuing here a little bit. And is this making sense? Oh, man, nobody said amen. Uh-oh. All right, let's keep going here. Hey, glory, amen. So listen, if the devil says, who do you think you are? You think you're a Christian? You don't love God. How could, how could you answer that? You could say, <clears throat> excuse me, Satan. And I don't recommend talking to Satan, okay? Um, but if you were, like Luther, you might say, hey, Satan, my love is not what secured my salvation in the first place. It was his great love that secured my salvation. And knowing that culminates love in me. It produces love in me. So no thank you. I've got my helmet on today. That's kind of the scenario here. So two... Uh, the first one was doubt. When Satan assaults you with doubt uh, on the assurance of your salvation, put the helmet on. Here's the second thing. Whew. Going fast here. Second thing is discouragement. 
Discouragement. You know, Satan loves to discourage God's people. He says, look around. You're not making any difference. Nothing's going to change. Everything's the same. You haven't grown any. Look at how weak you are. Look at how frail you are. Look at how tired and exhausted you are. Aren't you weary? God's made you fight this battle ever since you were a Christian. Aren't you tired of this? Aren't you? When's God going to give you relief? You know, lots of eminent Christian saints have thought that way. Historically, biblically, that's why the Bible's full of encouragement for people like that, because that's where Satan arm aims his artillery. Paul was writing to the Galatian church who had lost their joy. And in chapter 6, verse 9, he says this. He says this in two different places. He says, Do not grow weary while doing good, for we will all reap in due time. Did you hear that? That's a great verse. He says, Don't grow weary while doing good. You're exhausted. You're, that's okay. You're exhausted. God understands. God knows you're weary from the battle. I mean, we get to, I mean, talk to soldiers who have fought in wars. Man, it's, you're carrying all that equipment. You're always on alert. Your mind, you don't sleep. You don't rest. You, you sleep with one eye open. You're exhausted most of the time. Insects, heat, all this, you know, 50-pound luggage, and then the fear and the paranoia. You're exhausted. And that's why Paul uses this military analogy, I think, because Satan knows that. And that's precisely at the point he attacks. And Paul says, don't grow weary. You've been sowing. You're going to reap. You are going to reap. Listen, let me make a specific application to moms. Keep sowing because you're going to reap. Don't you think sometimes, man, I want to just reap some fruit here. Lord, give me, have mercy. I've been working. I've been fighting. I'm tired. I'm exhausted. I'm fatigued. Muscle fatigue, spiritual fatigue. I'm just ready to just... Let me, let me just cut this back a few notches. And then you know what? Church becomes like, on your priority, way down here. I see it all the time. And serving becomes way back here. And you're just on coast. And look, I'm a, I'm a church planner. I understand. People come to this church all the time who have burned out spiritually. And I just say, look, this is, you came to the right church. Um, sit back and, and be a sheep for a little while and heal. And then I think you'll be ready if you're listening to, to the message of this church. I think God's going to reinvigorate you and he's going to restore you. And one of these days you're going to come up and say, Pastor, I'm ready. I'm ready, coach. Send me in. Sign me up. I'm ready, to, I'm ready to live on mission. It happens all the time and it thrills my heart. So if you're in that condition, uh, hey, we need help. So let's go. Let's hurry up. Put the helmet of salvation on. Rest. Uh, be renewed in your spirit and jump back in the fight. There's a place in the Bible. It's... Uh, it's actually Psalm 73, one of my favorite psalms. Man, it's way over here. Yeah, it's, uh, it's about Asap. And he woke up one morning, and he looked around. And this is, a, this is a really popular psalm, by the way. You've probably heard this sung in lyrics, and you've read it. It's, if you go into a Christian store, it's, it's uh, stenciled on the wall and all that. But he woke up one morning and he looked around and he began to doubt God's love and he was wearied and he was discouraged. And he said, look, I know that truly God is good to Israel, to, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my, my steps are slipping. I'm sliding. I'm beginning to doubt. And here's why. Because Asap began to look around. You ever do this, Christians? He began to look around. He, he knew in reality what the, what the Old Testament, he was in the Old Testament, he knew what the Old Testament said about belonging to God and God is for you and he's with you, he'll never leave you, he'll never forsake you. But he also looked around and he saw conflict, you know? He, he saw enemies of God flourishing. He says things like, their bellies are full, uh, they don't die in agony like your children do, they seem to be free, happy-go-lucky, they're blessed, they're wealthy, I mean, they don't struggle, they're at peace with everybody. He said, so I look out there and I see that. And I look in here and I see a mess. He says, I wake up every day and you chasten me. I see God's people being chastised. I see them being persecuted. And he said, it's just too much for me, God. This is overwhelming for me. I can't handle this. See, he took his helmet off. And then there's a wonderful part in this psalm where everything changed. I love psalms like that. There's tension. There's conflict. There's chaos. And then there's this critical point in the psalm where he begins to think again. The Christian begins to think biblically about his life, about who he is in Christ or in God, Old Testament, and how he should live, and things change for him. And it changes in this verse. Check this out. He says, I was brutish and ignorant to think that way. 
I was like a beast. I was like an animal towards you, God, he said. And then he says this. Check this out. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will receive me to glory. And then here's the part you've probably seen stenciled on a wall. Whom have I in heaven but you? You remember this? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. You're like, what's he saying there? He's saying, I'm continually with you. He put his helmet back on. He said, Lord, what was I thinking? That was stupid. I belong to you. I'm not in trouble. These guys are in trouble because this is the only life they're ever going to have with any pleasure in it. You have pledged yourself to me forever. I have all of eternity to look forward to. I'm going to reign with you I don't have anybody on, in heaven or on earth that I desire besides you. So you, help, you hold my hand. You guide me. You're going to receive me to glory. That's all I need. Uh, let, the, let the missiles fire. Let the enemy launch his ammunition. I'm good. I love that psalm because that's a, that's a really powerful way to, to think. So when you're tired, when you're afraid, when you feel alone, when you feel de- defeated, um, Christians, think, ponder these realities, these beautiful realities of who we are in Jesus Christ. And I think one of the last things is I'll give you a quote from J.C. Ryle. Oh, you know what? Let me say this real quick. Talking about our future glory. I think a lot of Christians think about salvation in the past and maybe in the present. But guys, listen. History is not cyclical. Am I saying that the right way? Somebody help me out. It doesn't, it doesn't recycle itself, you know. When, when the curtain crashes down on this fallen planet, a new curtain is going to arise and we're going to be redeemed. We're going to live with Christ on a restored planet. Uh, no more suffering, no more conflict, no more war. Um, it's going to be peace. It's going to be glory. And that, that means that history is linear for us. It's linear. Christianity is the only religion or even ideology, if you want to call it that, that has that. You know, we don't come back uh, reincarnated, maybe as a skunk or something, okay? I'm sorry, I'm not mocking any other religions. Christianity says we're conformed to the image of Christ. And 1 John 3, 3 says when Christ, when Christ comes and we see him, we will be like him. Our salvation will be complete. And then he says this, and whoever has this hope in himself purifies himself. Did you know that thinking of heaven is a powerful thing to do? It is. It purifies you to think about this is not all there is. I feel sick. I feel weak. I see social injustice everywhere. I see Christians getting killed and martyred. I see a nation that's in turmoil. But look, guys, this is a little blip on the map of linear history. We have all eternity to celebrate what God is doing here and now. And that's powerful, the Bible says. So then J.C. Ryle says this. He says, Assurance goes far to set a child of God free from this painful kind of bondage and thus ministers mightily to his comfort. It enables him to feel that the great business of life is a settled business, the great debt a paid debt, the great disease a healed disease, and the great work a finished work. And all other business, diseases, debts, and works are then, by comparison, what? Small. You see, Christians... We keep, if you're going to keep an account log, don't let it be of your good and bad deeds, okay? Toss that. If you want to keep an account log, let it be of this present world's sufferings and all of glory because no matter how much suffering you put on the scales, Paul says uh, in Romans chapter 8, he says, I don't consider, I look around and I don't consider all these sufferings to even compare with the glory that's going to be revealed in Christ. The scales always tip in the favor of glory. Always, always. That's why we have a linear view of history. And this is the, the last thing I'll say, another favorite movie of mine. And I'm sorry, guys. I just, movies probably help people visually. One of my favorite movies of all time is Shawshank Redemption. And the very end of that, you know, there's two, I'm not going to give you the whole movie here. You probably know it. But a Morgan Freeman, his best movie ever, I think. He has been in prison all his life and his best friend escapes. And he wants to go join his best friend, but he keeps getting shut down every time he gets up for parole. Um, but finally, when he gets up for parole, they let him out. He's free, and his friend left him a letter. Like, look, I escaped prison. You can find me here on this exotic beach down in the coast of Texas where I'm going to be living my life in an in, in exotic paradise. And so Morgan Freeman, his name's Red in the movie, he finally gets out of prison, and he gets on a bus, and it's the, 
the end of movies are always the best parts. It's the very end of the movie, and he says these words. He's on that bus. He's, he's like giddy, like a little kid. He's so happy. Prison all his life. Finally gets out. He's going to see his best friend. And he says, I find I'm so excited I can barely sit still or hold a thought in my head. I think it's the, it's the excitement that only a free man can feel. A free man at the start of a long journey whose conclusion is uncertain. I hope I can make it across the border. I hope to see my friend and shake his hand. I hope the Pacific is as blue it is as, as it has been in my dreams. I hope. And I love that. But at the same time, Christian hope is not the kind of hope he talks about. I hope I can make it across the border. So if you don't, the deal's off, man. Sorry, you get arrested. You go back to jail for breaking parole. Uh, I hope I see my friend. What if you don't? What if his directions were bad? Uh, Our hope, biblical hope, is not that kind of hope. No, our hope is certain. It's not wishful thinking. It's we know all of God's promises to us in Jesus are yes and amen. And that's something that we can take, take to the bank. That's why... That's why the Apostle Peter says this, Therefore, preparing your minds for action, be sober-minded and set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We have a hope, we have an assurance. Uh, and When the enemy aims his arsenal and his weapons at that, friends, put on the helmet of salvation. Meditate on the glories, the powerful, glorious realities of who we are in Christ and that nothing can take that away from us. Amen? Well, let's pray.